when you walk into the, the house of a faithful follower of Christ, you're often likely to encounter scripture verses, scripture verses on plaques and, and pictures throughout their home. And these verses actually serve as a great reminder to those who live there to see them on a daily basis. But they're also a very simple way for us to declare our faith to anyone who enters our house. Got a few examples this morning of things that you might find in a house. This first one is one that's right outside the front door of Mary and my house. It says, as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. It's from Joshua, Joshua 24, 15. And we bought this years ago at a blacksmith shop in Silver Dollar City. And the point of it is we want people who come to our front door to know where we stand. Got another one for you here. This is... Be still and know that I am God. It comes from Psalm 46, which we read part of during our call to worship. Uh, that passage is up in our master bathroom. It, it's a, a good reminder to see that before you go to bed at night, and it's also a great reminder to look at that first thing in the morning. In fact, I should probably get it tattooed on my arm because I need that reminder very often. Here's another one. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. That comes from Psalm 107. Now this next one you might not be quite as familiar with. It comes from Paul's letter to the church at Canine. It says, I work hard so my dog can have a better life. Now if you find the book of Canine and that verse in the Bible in your house, we need to talk. I do promise you though this last one is from the Bible. It's a very powerful verse. It's on the wall in the house of one of my dear family members. It says, all things work together for good to those who love God. And it's from Romans 8.28. Romans 8.28 is actually sandwiched between a whole bunch of other powerful verses in that chapter. Uh, prior to that verse in Romans 8.14-17, through 17, Paul provides us with assurance Romans 8, 16 and 17 reads, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and then if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. What Paul's saying there is if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you belong to God. No worries. Period. Then after verse 28 in Romans 8, 31 to 39, Paul writes some things concerning our preservation. Romans 8, 38 and 39 state our being preserved in Christ very, very clearly. He says, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Those are great words. And what they're saying is that nothing, nothing that I do, nothing that you do, and, and there's not anything in all of creation that can separate you from the love of Jesus if you belong to him. Our place with Jesus is pre preserved. Nothing can spoil it. It can't be taken away. And with that, we might say double period. And then that brings us to Romans 8, 28. It's right in the middle of all this great teaching. And verse 28 is a, is a great source of encouragement. And I think we could all use some encouragement. I, I mean, think about it. We have lived through a pandemic. We thought it was over, and then it wasn't over. Many of us are experiencing COVID fatigue. We're tired of it. It sucks some of the hope out of us. We wonder when it will ever end. We wonder how many new variants are going to come along. The, the pandemic has caused illness. It's caused death. It's isolated people. It's caused depression and anxiety. It's even divided people. Just a week ago, Hurricane Ida wreaked destruction in Louisiana and then in the Northeast. People were killed. Homes and businesses were destroyed. Many no longer have a place to call home. 
And then we've got the situation in Afghanistan. I hate to say it, but I think we left that country in a shambles. We ran out. The fall of Kabul reminds some of us of the fall of Saigon and Vietnam. And both were disasters. And both were deadly. And that leads us to another reason that we can have discouragement today. Our country is divided. Sadly, it seems that we can't disagree on something and still be friends. Why can't we be friends? Truth seems to have caught the last train for the coast. It's leaving. For many people, truth doesn't exist. The Bible is no longer trusted by so many. People do whatever they want, even though the Bible is very clear that they they shouldn't be doing it. And so our, our Christian faith is under attack. God's under attack. And it's tough, and I think we would all agree, we need some encouragement. We need encouragement every day. And so Romans 8.28 is the perfect verse for today. It's the perfect verse for where we find ourselves today. It provides God's encouragement. You know, maybe we all need to buy a plaque like my family member with Romans 8.28 on it to, to hang on our walls and to read it every day. Here's, here's the way the verse reads in the English Standard Version of the Bible. It says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, to experience the encouragement this verse provides, we will, need, we will go through it literally word by word this morning because there's so much in just those few words. Paul began writing, he said, and we know, we know, What he was saying is we can be confident of the truth that Paul's about to share. Another way to say it is we can be confident in Christ. And that is the very first encouragement I think we find in this verse. And the truth is it's okay to be confident in Christ. It's okay to tell people that you know that you're a child of God and that you know that one day you're going to live in heaven. That's not bragging. It's stating a fact for those of us who belong to Jesus. It's stating the fact that's available to anyone who puts their trust in him. But as we continue on, Paul's next words might challenge us. They certainly can cause us to think. Paul said, for those who love God. I was sitting on the balcony of a cruise ship about a week and a half ago. And before, a minute ago I said we're not bragging if we show our confidence in Christ, but I am bragging right now. I was on a cruise ship. It was great. <laughs> But one afternoon, as I was sitting there watching the ocean go by, I had Romans 8, 28 right in front of me. When I read, for those who love God, a question hit me. Actually, a bunch of questions hit me as I sat there. And the first question that hit me was a really tough one. is, do I love God? Do I really love God with everything with, that is within me, or do I a lot of times just give God lip service? And, and then more questions filled my head. Do I love God more than my wife, more, more than my money, more than my family, more than my, my stuff, more than my comfort? It's easy to love God sitting on the deck of a cruise ship in the middle of the ocean because life is good, God is good. But, but what happens when my love for God or your love for God puts you at odds with the practices of our culture? Do do we love God when doing so could alienate friends and family? Is my love for God strong enough for me to forgive and to love my enemies? If you think about it, those are tough questions. But they're good questions. They're questions that can actually discourage us. They can make us feel terrible. But yet, in a, in a positive way, those questions can cause our faith to grow. That day, as I considered all my shortcomings in my love for God, I remembered something very important. I remembered grace. When my love for God or your love for God falls short, 
God still forgives. His grace is sufficient. Jesus died to pay the penalty for all my sins and for all your sins. When God looks at you or me, he doesn't see the disgusting dirt of our sins. Instead, he sees the righteous covering of Jesus over us. And and that is so reassuring. And that is so encouraging. Paul wrote, he said, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together. Now, did you notice what Paul didn't say there? Paul didn't say, some things work together. Paul Paul didn't even say, you know, most things work together. No, Paul wrote, all things work together. And that all things provide the second encouragement of this verse, and that is that God is sovereign. And that simply means that God is in control. He's in control of all things. And that's a truth that we need to focus on. The more we understand the sovereignty of God, the more we understand how he is in control of absolutely everything, the more you and I will experience comfort and peace. We'll be encouraged. Even though the world at times seems to be spinning out of control, it isn't. Now, I'm not saying things are going great, but I am saying that things could be a whole lot worse. As Christians, we know that God is in control and that he loves us and that our future is secure in him. When we were on a a tour bus bus back in Jamaica during our cruise, some guy kept singing the song, you might know it, Don't Worry, Be Happy. It was popular a long time ago. And by the 20th time he sang it, it was starting to get just a little bit annoying. In fact, the guy sitting behind me was about to ruin that guy's happiness and cause him reason to worry. But of course, you and I, we don't have to worry. We can be happy. We can have joy because we know God is in control. We're blessed. I'm blessed. And one of those many blessings that God has given us is to have people in your life who've got your back. They look out for you. They have your best interests in mind. Of course, my wife Mary is number one on that list. She happens to be my biggest fan, my greatest supporter, and my most determined defender. And not only that, she thinks I'm cute, smart, and eloquent. And that just goes to prove that the saying was right when they said love is blind, and I'd also add that it's probably deaf and dumb too. But besides a spouse, many of us have two or three others in our life who have our back. And life would be a whole lot tougher without them. These amazing people stick up for us even when we don't deserve it. They protect us. They think highly of us. They shut down those who try to criticize us. They're loyal. They know us deeply, and yet they still love us. They inspire us to be better people. And they actually challenge us to be more like them. And I'd like you to just take a second here, just take a moment to think about who fills that role in your life. Thank them, and then thank God for them, and then be that same person for someone else. Those people who have our back are great, but as great as they are, you know what the truth is, they don't compare to God. When it comes to having our back, when it comes to having your back, nobody comes close to God. God has our back. That is the third encouragement of this verse. Paul wrote, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. God having our back means all things work together for our good. We don't need to worry. We can be happy. We can have joy. The king of the universe has your back. And he's working for your good. Now, when we hear that word good... 
is to choose here that good may not be exactly what you and I think it is. You know, it's easy to think of God working for our good in the kind of the wrong way. Good to us might be a lot of money, great health, a perfect family, a fun job, whatever, a wonderful retirement. And those things can certainly be good. But God works for our greater good, something even better. And that greater good from God is our becoming more like Jesus. And it's a lifelong process. We never arrive. It's, a, it's something that's called sanctification. And that simply means we become more holy. God wants his children. He wants us to be sanctified, to grow in holiness, to look a little more like Jesus every day. The next words in Romans 8.28 state, for those who are called... We have been called by God. And that's the fourth encouragement found in this verse. The fact is, is that we are special. God chose you. He chose me. The NIV Study Bible says this calling from God is an effectual calling. And that just means it works. When God calls us, we answer. His call never fails. The NIV Bible Study says it this way. It says, God's effectual calling powerfully draws sinners into a relationship with him. And we're in, we're in the book of Romans. Paul wrote this entire letter to the church at Rome. And, and one of the early verses in that book say this. He says, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people. That's you. That's me. The only reason any one of us is here in this church this morning is because God loves us and because God has called us. Romans 8, 29 and 30 states, For those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Among those he predestined he also called, and those whom he called he also justified, and those whom he justified he also glorified. In Romans 10, 9, it adds our response to God's calling. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. God called you. You are special. Don't ever forget it. Please, don't ever forget your value to God. Let's go ahead and read verse 28 one last time, and I want you to pay particular attention to the last words of this verse, and I've got them underlined and highlighted so you can't miss them. Paul said, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. God called us to save us. He called us to be his children. It's part of his purpose. Remember we read Romans 8, 16, and 17 just a few minutes ago. It says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. God's purpose leads to our purpose. And that's the last encouragement that I found in Romans 8, 28. See, a life without purpose is a life without meaning. And the encouragement is that our life has a purpose. Your life has purpose. It has meaning. You're here for a reason. And our chief purpose is to glorify God. The, the New City Catechism answers the question of, of how you and I glorify God. And it says we glorify God by enjoying Him, loving Him, trusting Him, and obeying his will, commands, and law. Remember what Jesus said? He told us to love God and to, to love people. If we do those things to the best of our ability, relying on God's strength and support, our life will have meaning. Our life will have purpose. I want to close with a story I read on social media a couple weeks ago. Here it is. The, whoever wrote it says this. They said, a while back, I read a story of a visiting pastor 
who attended a men's breakfast in the middle of a rural farming area in the country. The group had asked an older farmer, decked out in his bib overhauls, to say grace for the morning breakfast. Lord, I hate buttermilk, the farmer began. The visiting pastor opened one eye to glance at the farmer and wondered, where is he going? The farmer then loudly proclaimed, Lord, I hate lard. Now the pastor was becoming to get concerned. Without missing a beat, the farmer continued, and Lord, you know, I don't much care for raw white flour. At this time, the pastor once again opened an eye to glance around the room, and he saw that he wasn't the only one that was starting to feel uncomfortable. But then the farmer added, he said, but Lord, when you mix them all together and bake them, I do love warm, fresh biscuits. So Lord, when things come up that we don't like, when life gets hard, when we don't understand what you're saying to us, help us to just relax and wait until you're done mixing. It'll probably be even better than the biscuits. Amen. And then the writer of the story concluded, he said, within that prayer there is great wisdom for all when it comes to complicated situations like we are experiencing in the world today. He says, stay strong, my friends, because our Lord is mixing several things together that we don't really care for. But something even better is going to come when he is done with it. Life can be filled with discouragements. Our life isn't always easy. It sometimes seems very, very unfair. Each day presents new challenges. And we could become burdened. We don't always see how God is taking all that bad stuff and making something for our good. See, God makes something good for those who love him and for those who he's called. Even if we don't realize it at the moment. So if you're discouraged, and even if you're not discouraged, I I ask you this week to read Romans 8. Read the entire chapter. And then after you read it, focus on Romans 8.28. Read it several times. Meditate on it. Pray. Ask God for encouragement. As Paul wrote in another letter, he said, encourage one another with these words. And then remember, have confidence in God. Know that God is in control. God has our back. We are special. And our life has a purpose. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning from all different places. Some of us are just excited to have a three-day weekend. Others of us are burdened because someone we love, someone we care about is sick, or someone that we love or care about is um, not close to us anymore. Father, maybe we worry about our kids or our grandkids. We wonder what kind of world they're growing up in. But Father, we know that through the Holy Spirit you are with us. And that all these things, all these things, as bad as they may be, as bad as they may feel, that somehow you're working them for good. That when we're faced with a crisis or discouragement, we can either turn our back on you or we can run into your arms. Father, I pray this morning that we would always run to your arms. We find healing in your hands. We find comfort. We find love. We find hope. Hope for today and hope for eternity. Father, we close this prayer by praying the words together that are commonly known as the Lord's Prayer. Saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. While the worship team comes up, if you're able, please stand as we sing our closing song.